Welcome everybody uh, once again uh, to our um, Stochastic Programming Society's virtual seminar series, Decision Making in an Uncertain World. And um, today uh, we are very honored uh, to have uh, Dr. David Morton uh, from Northwestern University. Uh, it's also a pleasure for me because uh, everything I know uh, has been, uh, they've uh, taught me everything I know about Stochastic Programming. Um, so um, it's an honor to introduce him. Uh, he is currently the SOX professor and department chair in the Industrial Engineering and Management Sciences Department at Northwestern University. Uh, before that, he was the engineering founding foundation professor at the University of Texas at Austin. And uh, he has a bachelor's degree in mathematics and physics at Stetson University and his master's and PhD in art and operations research from Stanford University. And um, he also did a postdoc at Naval Postgraduate School. Um, he has, um, as many of you know, uh, has been a former uh, chair of the Committee on Stochastic Programming uh, before it was a Stochastic Programming Society. Um, and uh, I believe he's the one who wrote the bylaws that made it a society or had that uh, transitioning at least uh, possible. Uh, so we thank him for his service. Also, he has chaired um, the Informs Optimization Society recently, and he has uh, many awards. Uh, let's see, one of the, so he was uh, given the Presidential Early Career Award, I believe from Clinton. Uh, and, um, in, you know, Nicholson Paper Prize, many other paper prize, uh, including a Best Publication Award in Energy as well. And, Today, um, he has, uh, I think, uh, a perfect talk for decision-making in an uncertain world, especially in the current uncertain world that we're living in with COVID-19. Um, and um, as usual, before we start our seminar, uh, we're going to ask our speaker, what is uh, your approach uh, or your view of decision-making under uncertainty? All right. Well, thanks. <clears throat> thanks very much, Kuzin. Uh, so in terms of the, uh, the question on my kind of view of decision making under uncertainty. So I, uh, I grabbed this, uh, this quote, which is actually the first sentence from, uh, <clears throat> from Dan's linear programming and extensions. So in 1963, he said the final test of a theory is its capacity to solve the problems which originated it. Uh, to my mind, I think that makes a lot of sense uh, in terms of uh, an approach in general, including uh, to decision making in an uncertain uh, world. And that's true whether you're <clears throat> a developing theory or whether you're trying to solve problems that might originate uh, your theory. All right, so just to Kind of jump into it. I'm going to talk about uh, COVID-19, how to relax social distancing if you must. Uh, and I think the, the if you must phrase will probably become clear as we kind of go through the go through the talk. So there's a, <clears throat> a large group of uh, collaborators. So the, the folks on the on the top row are in one way or another connected uh, with uh, with me. So Danielle, uh, Bismarck, Haosheng are all uh, PhD students or former PhD students of, uh, of mine. Uh, Oz is a PhD student at, uh, at Northwestern now just uh, finishing up. And Cindy and a tutor too, uh, interns working uh, this summer with us. And then the folks on the bottom row are all uh, in one way or another at, at UT Austin. Uh, and I used to be at University of Texas at, uh, at Austin uh, as well and did some work with Lauren Myers, who's a mathematical uh, epidemiologist there. All right, so I'm gonna start the talk with a few caveats. So I'm, so I'm not a epidemiologist with any sort of adjective, mathematical or otherwise, uh, but as I just said, I, I know one and I've collaborated uh, with her over the, over the years. And as I think you'll probably get a sense, we, we've tried to do a fair amount of work in, uh, in a relatively short amount of time. And so it's inevitable, and we do the same thing, you know, 
why didn't you try uh, this? And so I, I welcome those, those kind of questions and comments. And you yeah, kind of understand the, the optics of uh, an American sort of lecturing on, uh, on COVID-19 response given uh, the current state of things. But I think there's kind of a story to tell here and on, in certain senses, we, we do need some help. Um, I'm not claiming by any stretch that, uh, that this talk is aspiring to uh, Danzig's goal. And I'll just sort of apologize by saying there's no literature re review of it all uh, that I'll talk about here. There's a fair amount of, uh, uh, a lot of work in this area and a lot of work that continues to uh, emerge. And if you came to this talk for theorems, it's, the, it's not the right talk. Uh, so, all right, so just for a warm, a warm up. So let's talk a little bit about compartmental models and epidemiology. So an SIR model uh, has three compartments a susceptible compartment, an infectious compartment, and a recovered compartment for the S, I, and R. Um, and you can view this as a system of differential equations uh, where beta involves a rate uh, between S and I, and gamma involves a rate between I and T. Um, there's this product between S and I. So you can view this as a set of differential equations, and that's the way I've written it down, but you can also view it as a continuous time uh, Markov chain in a complementary uh, type model. If you view it as a continuous time Markov chain, then right, the interesting thing is that the, the rate of transition out of susceptible doesn't just depend on the, the number in that state. It also depends on the number in the, uh, the infectious uh, component. So cap N here is the, the total number of people in the, in the population. So this is the rate at which people leave uh, susceptible. This is the rate at which people enter infectious. They recover uh, from being infectious at a rate gamma. Uh, and with this kind of scaling, so R naught, this, uh, this number that at least in the stochastic model is the expected number of people that a, a single infectious individual uh, will infect is given by this ratio of beta uh, by gamma. And herd immunity that we hear about uh, is one minus one over R naught. So again, just as kind of a, a warm up before we get into details. So if, uh, if we pick that beta and gamma so that this ratio is two, then that means that the herd immunity is a half. So this green line is the, uh, the recovered folks with immunity. And so if that green line started at 50%, uh, then we would have uh, herd immunity so that there wouldn't be further people uh, infected. However, uh, it doesn't plateau at 50% uh, because there's a bunch of people in the pipeline because of this exponential growth and we, can, we overshoot the, the herd immunity at 50% here. So suppose instead that we pick uh, the beta and the gamma so that this R naught is just four thirds instead of two, then herd immunity drops to a quarter. So again, you know, if this green uh, line were to start at 25%, then, uh, then the, we wouldn't have growth. But again, we kind of overshoot uh, that 25% that here. Right, so this graph says, oh, suppose that uh, we do some kind of social distancing so that R0 is uh, effectively knocked down to four thirds for the first 500 time periods. Uh, and then after 500 time periods, we kind of relax and go uh, back to the, the R0 equals two case or maybe the not is no longer uh, applies. So what you can see here is instead of plateauing around 0.8, uh, because we had this social distancing and we kind of got people sick uh, at a slower rate initially, we, we don't quite overshoot uh, as much. So this is not quite what we're uh, gonna talk about today, but I think it's helpful in terms of kind of the, the warm up as I was, uh, I was saying. So a little bit more warm up, Instead of doing the continuous time model, let's uh, discretize this model. So this is the exact same model, uh, right? We start with a single infectious individual. Everybody else is susceptible. And then, um, so let's change that beta, uh, which has to do with uh, the transmission rate. Let's start and index that by T because behavior might change over time. 
Okay, so let's do the right exact same model. Uh, let's write that down, except for now we can kind of have two different beta levels, sort of like the, uh, the one that corresponded to four thirds R naught and one that corresponded to an R naught of two. So we could have a threshold, uh, a lockdown trigger uh, that would say, if the rate at which people are being infected, so the IT minus IT minus one, if that's smaller than this lockdown threshold, then we won't socially distance. But if the, the rate at which people are getting uh, infected exceeds this threshold, then we're gonna social distance and go with, uh, with beta prime. All right, so this is we're kind of heading, as you might see, towards uh, an SIR uh, or SIR MIP. So we've got these indicator functions here, uh, which we could uh, express using binary variables. And so here's, a, uh, here's an SIR uh, MIP. So I introduce one more term here. So let B, it's gonna be hospital beds later on, let B be the capacity for the system to handle infectious people then we might want to pick lockdown thresholds so that we minimize the number of days that we have to spend in lockdown because it's um, economically and socially disruptive to, to be in lockdown. Uh, but we've also got this constraint that says, oh, hey, the number of people that are infected, let's keep that below uh, capacity. Right, so. You can imagine writing this as a, as a mixed integer program. And I kind of started here because that's exactly where we started in kind of late March trying to, to write this down. Um, you can see here these, we got these bilinear terms, you know, S and I are effectively uh, continuous variables here. Uh, there's also a binary variable uh, or a pair that appear uh, through, this, uh, through this beta term. So we've got some uh, McCormick linearizations uh, to do here. So we're not going to solve the model this way. We started formulating this way and tried. Uh, so kind of a challenge here is, can we solve this style of mixed integer program uh, for about you know, 4,000 time periods, a little bit over a year with 10 time steps per day? Um, so S and I, right? There's just this pair here um, over all the time periods but we're gonna have models that have more than uh, uh, just this number of compartments. And so we should think kind of in that term. And even if you could solve this model, it wouldn't be all that helpful uh, because there's stochastic uh, elements uh, to here that, uh, that, that play an important role here. So then the MIP challenge is, okay, if you can solve it like this, then, uh, then let's add uh, sample paths that capture the stochasticity and perhaps change this into a chance constraint, for example. Or maybe that's not the right way to think about this. Maybe uh, we should think about this from a derivative free optimization perspective, because what I'm really trying to do is pick these lockdown thresholds, which could depend on uh, time. And so maybe I should view this as a derivative free optimization. Okay, so that's kind of the warm up. And then, uh, uh, so we didn't solve that model. Rather, we have, uh, we have an enhanced uh, SEIR model. So the E is new, so that's uh, exposed. So we've got susceptible and exposed. Uh, we have infectious that are asymptomatic or symptomatic. Uh, we've got folks that are in the hospital, recovered or deceased. Uh, they're both macro and micro stochastics here. So we're gonna have, uh, uh, exponential sojourn times in, uh, in this rate transition diagram, or rather when we discretize things, then we're going to have a, uh, a binomial number of transitions uh, in this rate diagram. So those are the micro stochastics. The macro stochastics are some of these uh, rates like this sigma. Oh, we don't know exactly, uh, but we might posit uh, triangular distributions on the rates of recovery or the rates of uh, moving from being exposed to being infectious. All right, so I'm just gonna sketch briefly a, a model here. There's time periods, uh, 10 time periods per day over a course of a bit more than a year. We've got five age groups that you can see here. And then we have high risk and low risk. So the reason I had that 10 times 10 before is because when you look at the age risk group combinations, you've got 10 uh, such pairs. And so what you should imagine is not a single rate transition diagram like this, but uh, actually 10 of them kind of in parallel. And I'll say in a second how they link. 
Okay, so we are, what kind of parameters? We've still got this transmission rate parameter. We've got parameters like uh, sigma, the, the rate at which exposed individuals become infectious or actually more infectious. And then this phi is important. So this is the expected number of daily contacts from people in one age risk group to those in another. Uh, so this contact matrix is going to be uh, an important driver that we can affect, uh, we can change to effectively change the transmission rate. And then there's, uh, there's a population, hey, just what are the demographics of, uh, this is going to be at the city level, what are the demographics uh, in the age risk group combinations? The kind of state variables, how many people are in each of these compartments? And then something that we're going to look at is the, the number of daily admissions from those that have symptoms into the, into the hospital. We're going to actually track the seven day moving average of that uh, when we try to control things here. In terms of intervention variables, um, so kind of like I just sketched, imagine you have a binary variable that's one if you're in lockdown, maybe that'll reduce transmission by 90% or it'll be zero otherwise. But we're not going to fully relax things. So we'll go back to maybe 40% uh, social distancing or, or rather a just a 40% rather than a 90% reduction in uh, transmission. And then I already mentioned the lockdown thresholds. There's also going to be a safety trigger that uh, we're going we're gonna to lock down, uh, but then we're going to want to relax that. Uh, but we will want the number of hospitalizations to be below some threshold. And then this contact matrix is going to depend on our binary variable. Uh, yes, no, are we in lockdown? All right, so I know there's a lot here, but this is really simple. It's nothing more than uh, the, uh, the kind of flow in this uh, rate transition diagram that I just sketched uh, for the SIR case, but now we've got a few more compartments. Uh, and I'm just going to reduce it to what's what's kind of important here. And so remember, we used to have this S times I uh, bilinear terms. So now we have S in a particular age group, uh, risk group, and then we have infectious uh, that are symptomatic. We have infectious that are asymptomatic, and then we have people that have been exposed. And we assume that there are lower uh, infectiousness uh, in these latter two groups. And then here's this binary toggle that says, uh, uh, oh, should we uh, say that we're in the, the high rate of reduction for uh, the contact matrices, or we're, uh, we're not, the, the XT is zero, we're not in lockdown, and so uh, we're in a low uh, social distancing version of these contact matrices. So here's, I'm going to describe this threshold policy in words and then just sketch the math quickly. So we're going to either be in one of two states that we can toggle between. One is to be in lockdown, and again, that's 90% reduction in transmission in this initial model I'll describe. Uh, and we're going to be in lockdown when the seven-day moving average of daily hospital admissions exceeds a trigger. And then given that we're in lockdown, we're going to relax and go back to just a 40% reduction in transmission rather than 90 uh, when two things happen. One is that that seven day average has to drop below that same trigger. And the second thing is that the total number of people in the hospital have to drop below uh, a particular factor that I called RT before but we're just gonna set this to 60% of uh, hospital capacity or rather hospital capacity uh, for COVID patients. And then once you relax, so you can imagine these kind of control models might wanna to toggle back and forth uh, with some frequency in, a, in something that would be unrealistic from a policy perspective. So once you relax, we're gonna assume that you have to relax for, uh, for two weeks. All right, so this is just that in math. Uh, this is the, the rate at which people are entering the hospital, summing over the age and risk groups. This is taking the seven-day moving average. Oh, that seven-day moving average exceeds the threshold, then you have to, to be in lockdown. Uh, you were in lock, lockdown last period, uh, and heads in bed still exceeds the, the safety threshold, then you have to stay in lockdown 
uh, or you uh, are forced out of uh, lockdown. And once you leave lockdown, you need to leave it for, for two weeks. Okay, so let's, we can write down kind of a deterministic optimization model. So I should have said before, uh, equations one, those were the ones that had the epidemiological uh, dynamics. Uh, constraints two here are characterizing the uh, lockdown threshold. And then here's a model. Uh, so this model just says, hey, obey the, uh, uh, the epidemiological dynamics. Uh, follow your threshold uh, policy by selecting the L and the R here. And then there's one additional constraint here, which is 3D. So there's a square root staffing rule of, uh, of half and wit. Uh, so this is for an MMSQ. Uh, it is often used in the context of, uh, of call centers. Uh, and the question is, if I'm kind of in uh, the, where Lambda is large, uh, so we have a lot of uh, arrivals to the hospital or call center, and we have a service rate mu, then how many uh, servers do we require in order to maintain a high probability that an arrival doesn't have to wait for service? So that is an arriving patient uh, doesn't have to wait to, to get a bed in the hospital. And the square root staffing rule says that, uh, uh, that you need to pick the number of servers in this way. Uh, and so our lambda bar is gonna be selected in this way. So we know, say, the number of beds in the hospital. Uh, the things that we determine in this optimization model will determine the arrival rate to, uh, uh, to the hospital. We've got an estimate of the, of the service rate. And when we pick our controls, we want the arrival rate to stay below lambda bar. We use k equals four, which uh, corresponds to this probability for a single uh, arriving patient in a, in a steady state of an MMSQ. So this Cal F is going to be what are the lockdown and relaxation levels uh, for which there's a solution to epidemiological dynamics, uh, the uh, uh, the lockdown policy, and this square root staffing rule constraint. So if you solve this model uh, and get a solution, uh, but then test it in a stochastic environment, you're, you're not gonna do very well. Uh, that is, if, if you mistime the uh, uh, sort of an exponential mm -hmm. takeoff of the peak, you'll overshoot hospital capacity, which is kind of the, what we're trying to stay within here. So here's a stochastic model that says, so I'm, I'm kind of using things in two different ways here. I wrote down these equations, one before the, the epidemiological dynamics. And they're a deterministic set of equations, for example, with a rate transition of sigma for, for one of the transitions. Uh, and so when I say equation one for all omega, I really mean, oh no, we, we've got binomial uh, transitions between all the, the compartments and, and we're looking at sample paths across those uh, uh, epidemiological dynamics. Ditto with uh, the constraints. So these state variables are gonna depend on the sample path we're gonna pick lockdown and relaxation thres thresholds to minimize the expected number of days in lockdown or time periods. And uh, the one new thing here is this chance constraint that says, all right, take a sample path, calculate the number of heads and beds uh, in the hospital, take the maximum over all time period, all time periods for that sample path, make sure that that's under hospital capacity, and we want this to hold uh, with high probability. We're gonna use 95% uh, in what we do. And so B is uh, the COVID capacity in a hospital. All right, so that's the basic model. Uh, and that's most of the math of what I'm gonna show you. So the kind of things that we've done here have been applied in Austin, uh, Texas. And so there's Texas, uh, there's Texas even bigger, uh, and then Austin, the metropolitan area, uh, there's an MSA, Metropolitan Statistical Area, which is about 2.1 million uh, in, in Austin, and forward. So here's kind of a timeline of, uh, of things in, uh, uh, in Texas that are COVID related. So the first case was uh, early uh, March, so the 
the Austin mayor declared a state of emergency and actually canceled South by Southwest, which is a major festival uh, in on March 6th. Uh, a week later, the Texas governor declared a, declared a state of emergency. By that time, there were 50 cases. Uh, March 24th, Austin mayor issued a, a stay home uh, work safe order. And then a week later, the, uh, the Texas governor issued a, a stay home order. The, um, at that point, there were about 3,000 uh, statewide cases. It wasn't until April 3rd that the CDC recommended using face masks, uh, about 5,000 cases by that time. So we're now in lockdown, right? The Austin mayor, the Texas governor has a, a stay home order. On April 13th, Austin mandated uh, face masks with provisions for a thousand dollar fine. Uh, a couple weeks after that, uh, the Texas governor said cities cannot uh, mandate uh, use of face masks. So then on, on May 1st, uh, Texas was one of the first states uh, to, to open up. On May 1st, restaurants, malls, movie theaters uh, opened at a 25% level. Uh, later in May, uh, child care centers and importantly bars, of course, were, uh, were opened up. Uh, June 3rd, all businesses were open at, uh, at 50%. Uh, and you can see the rising case counts while, uh, while this is happening. Restaurants are, are further open, and then just kind of where we are uh, as of uh, yesterday in terms of total case counts in the state of Texas. So that's kind of the timeline, and it hints at some tension between uh, state leaders and uh, city leaders. So some more kind of key dates. So you can argue this first one may not be a key date, but uh, I didn't mention it earlier. So we're gonna use February 15th uh, to initiate our simulation model with just a single case in, in Austin. And again, I said March 24th is the, uh, the stay home order. May 1st uh, opens up. Memorial Day is, uh, is a major holiday in the US. This is the Friday before more Memorial Day, uh, Independence Day, July 4th. And then in Austin, schools are scheduled to open on uh, August 18th. Okay, so in late April, we did the following uh, analysis. Uh, so we use that, that kind of enhanced SEIR style, style model that I, I showed you. And to kind of orient you here, this is hospitalizations. This is daily admissions. Uh, you can see the, uh, uh, this graph corresponds to indefinite lockdown through September 2021. So for more than the next year, assume we're in lockdown. Uh, you can see the red line in terms of the, uh, the total number of people in the hospital. There's some data points here. Uh, the black line is the total number of deaths. There are 90% prediction intervals here. You can barely see it, but there's a cyan solid line here uh, that shows the number of, uh, of daily admissions. Right. Here's uh, another graph. So this is presumably uh, untenable uh, to be an indefinite uh, lockdown. Um, here's another graph that says, okay, we opened up as of, uh, of May 1st. And so now instead of a 90% reduction in transmission, we've got just a 40% reduction. Uh, hospital capacity here is assumed to be 3,200 uh, beds. And now you can see that uh, the number of people uh, requiring hospitalization uh, blows through the capacity significantly. Uh, this number of deaths uh, turns out to be like ballpark 2,900. I mean, this is an underestimate because it's assuming that all these people had access to good uh, health care, uh, but obviously they, they would not in this case. So the purple versus the yellow is just showing schools opening on uh, August 18th. So this may be untenable. Uh, this is clearly unacceptable in terms of blowing through hospital capacity. So here's uh, applying the optimization model I sketched where May 1st, uh, we open up. Here's uh, a lockdown threshold. So when the seven day moving average, uh, which is just a little bit after the, the, the current state, uh, crosses this threshold, we go into lockdown. This sort of bends the, the curve uh, in, in hospitals uh, and then we relax, uh, but there's essentially enough herd immunity, well, herd immunity conditional on this 40% of uh, a reduction that uh, uh, 
that the epidemic kind of sort of tails off from there. And again, we have uh, 2,900 uh, deaths as a point estimate. And if you were to scale that 2,900 up uh, from what we were estimating in late April, that's about 240,000 uh, across the US. Right, and you can see that this threshold here, we allow the threshold to go larger uh, later in, in time. So this basically would delay opening of school uh, from mid-August until uh, maybe third week in September. And I should say that this policy, right, the, the policy is when does the line cross this threshold, uh, and we're just plotting the, the gray shading for a single path uh, of what the action is under that policy. So this is the exact same thing. One thing I haven't mentioned yet is that we assume here 95% cocooning of uh, the vulnerable populations, that is these high-risk populations. Uh, if you just drop that from 95% cocooning, that's 95% reduction in transmission to 80%, then uh, you can see that you need to spend a heck of a lot more time in lockdown and deaths are continuing to climb. So one of the key messages here is that cocooning vulnerable populations is, uh, is important. So this is late April where in the, uh, the mayor of Austin, uh, who's Steve Adler, so he tweeted uh, these to say, what happens if we do nothing? What what's an optimal path uh, forward? What happens if we fail to cocoon? So we had some conversations on, uh, on trying to present the city uh, simple policies that were implementable. So I just described this toggle policy. And then the city said, well, why do we just have to have on off? Uh, why can't we have like these five stages? Uh, with, with different rules for each stage. So this came out on, on May 13th. Uh, and then they added these thresholds uh, where, so maybe try to hang on to these numbers of so five, uh, 20, and 70 that move you into different levels of, uh, of social distancing, with red corresponding to uh, an effective lockdown, uh, green corresponding to business as usual. So where did these thresholds come from? So we basically extended uh, what, uh, what I just described in terms of the toggle between two states to being able to toggle between these five different states. So now yellow was the stage three there. Uh, you can see the hospital capacity went from 3,200, which we uh, estimated before, uh, to the hospital said, nah, it's really more 1,100 for COVID patients. People are still having strokes, still uh, having heart attacks. And so you can see that if we stay in this yellow level, stage three, uh, then we blow through hospital capacity like before, but here's an optimized uh, policy with uh, levels of five, 20, and 70 uh, to take us into yellow, orange, and red. And again, 90% prediction intervals trying to stay with high probability below uh, this uh, 1100 uh, level of capacity. All right, so that's where those, uh, those numbers came from. There's a dashboard that I'll show you an image of in a, in a second. Uh, so this is actually early April where there were, uh, where we're in stage three, this yellow stage. And basically for two months, uh, hospital admissions were just flat, which was kind of remarkable. Uh, and then in early June, uh, things started to rise. So uh, the mayor here is saying, uh, look, our moving average, the seven-day moving average is up to 17. This is alarming. We need to keep this number under 20. Um, there's a concerned American who tweets that hitting 20 means nothing. Uh, you need to be at 20 for seven days in a row. The concerned American is told to learn math. The concerned American says, so what does that mean? And I don't know if that's a pun uh, in terms of the seven-day moving average, but... Uh, <clears throat> American Liz says, alarming, are you just trying to create fear? How did you get to this number 20? So we haven't given American Liz the paper yet. Uh, so Tasha Ann, who's Wonder Girl, uh, she, said, she says at this rate, actually the day before, she said we're gonna hit 20 in about three days. Uh, so Wonder Girl was spot on. So three days later, the, uh, uh, we crossed into uh, a seven-day moving average that was above 20. And so, as I kind of hinted already, there was this tension between the state and the, and the city. And so, uh, on June 16th, right after crossing into Orange, I'm not saying that there was necessarily a connection, but soon thereafter, 
the mayors of the nine biggest cities in Texas uh, wrote an open letter to the governor and said, uh, you know, we would like the ability to impose uh, rules regarding face masks. And uh, two days later, the Texas governor allowed Austin and uh, in fact, cities across the, uh, the state to uh, require face masks under, under the threat of fine. And then in early July, uh, the governor uh, actually ordered Texans in most counties, there was a, a threshold of how many COVID cases uh, there had to be uh, to, to wear face masks. And the dynamics are kind of remarkable here. And there was an article that uh, says the governor is walking the middle road uh, here. And so there's a growing number of uh, sheriffs, it says, that refuse to enforce the, the face mask uh, requirement. So in the middle of July, teachers in uh, across Texas uh, marched in the, the Capitol, which is Austin. Uh, and one of their demands was that the, that the seven day moving average of new hospitalizations has to be under five uh, in order for us to, to go back to teaching. So let me say a little bit about kind of the quality of the, <clears throat> of the fit here. So these are the same two plots like hospitalizations and daily admissions. Um, so this is fitting with data up to uh, like that May 22nd, like that Friday before Memorial Day. Um, and so there's no data that's used after that for the fit. Uh, and this is the point estimate, which is really that fluid model. And, uh, and you can see data uh, in terms of actual hospitalizations here, as well as these spaghetti uh, plots on 300 sample paths. And this is the same kind of uh, information with, the, uh, with daily admissions as opposed to heads and beds. So the model, uh, even though it's a mass action model, it's not capturing super spreaders. Uh, it, it seemed to do pretty well in terms of understanding uh, that things were taking off here. So there's concern. This uh, was just instead of quality of data, sort of quality of listening. Are people actually listening to, uh, to the advice that's being given? So. This is a, a dashboard, uh, there are easier ways to get to it, but this is a dashboard uh, that shows the, the number of new admissions on a day with the seven day moving average, uh, and now the, these different uh, thresholds. So uh, the capacity of the hospitals seems to evolve over time. And so we've run the model multiple times at different capacities. So here the thresholds are now 10, 40, uh, that 70 showed before, and now the, the city's given themselves some wiggle room. They can either be in red when they go into 70, uh, or that 123 is driven by the health and wit uh, square root staffing uh, rule. So like I said, this is early July. This is actually July 6th is the, the peak here. So in early July, uh, July 1st actually was uh, crossing the, the 70 threshold as to what it meant to be in red. Uh, and so on July 1st, uh, with concern that the, the folks weren't actually listening to uh, social distancing guidelines. So in the convention center, uh, city officials signaled that they were starting to set up an alternate uh, care site. And uh, it took a few weeks for this to, to be set up. But as of July 24th, they said it's, uh, it's ready to go. And actually all the so beds and such are there, uh, but it's not staffed with people yet. Uh, so the idea is that uh, once the infrastructure is there, then hopefully uh, physicians and staff and nursing staff could be brought in uh, more quickly. So we did uh, an alternative care analysis, again, with this kind of trigger optimization. Um, and this is all with the notion that, well, we aren't doing a, we, we can't control how people are uh, behaving. So we observed yellow behavior effectively between uh, Memorial Day and uh, late June. Um, and so what this is, is we're effectively behaving now in uh, a lockdown mode, even though it's not official. And then we, uh, uh, if we need more capacity, then here's a trigger of, uh, of 100 uh, that, uh, 
uh, says, oh, if you need to go up to a capacity of 5,000, if when schools open August 18th, you start to behave in, uh, in yellow uh, again. And the next slide, the next says, oh, but suppose instead we behave in orange, then again, a trigger of 100, but then just adding 1500 beds is sufficient. And the optimization model is uh, it's delaying the opening of this as late as possible uh, and being 95% sure that, uh, that we have enough capacity. Uh, this is just repeats what you just saw. And this is, well, I suppose we're kind of halfway in between red and orange, then actually you don't need uh, alternative care site capacity at all. Just a, a couple more, uh, a couple or three more slides to, to say where we are uh, and where we're going. So the, the, uh, the model has higher fidelity now. We're adding uh, an intensive care unit uh, compartment because we're, instead of just general heads and uh, beds capacity, we can have a bottleneck that's a ICU capacity. So I won't go into any uh, detail here other than to say that uh, we're, we're in the process of doing fitting procedures uh, that uh, basically least squares uh, fit of the transmission uh, parameters uh, to account for uh, an ICU analysis. Another thing that we spent some time doing, so here's uh, analysis for Houston. And when we, when we talked to Houston, uh, they asked uh, us to do three capacities that I'll show. Um, so this solid black line is the sort of the fluid model, the deterministic model, but we have 300 sample paths here and we could try to pick a sample path that's kind of representative of that cloud. If you just do standard least squares, you get something that's really flat because there are multiple peaks and the timing varies along sample path. So we don't do that. Uh, and you can see a stochastic path here and a stochastic path on daily admissions here with, uh, with optimized triggers for Houston. It's about three times bigger than in Austin. So when we uh, did this for Houston, they said uh, run it for capacities 4,500, 9,000 beds or 13,500 beds. Uh, and like, what is your capacity is, uh, is an important question in this context. So this is the next, the last slide, I think. Um, so Travis is the county where uh, Austin is. It's the fifth largest county in the, in the state, relatively speaking, uh, given what's going on in Texas. Uh, Travis has been doing reasonably well. As I, so Harris is the county that includes uh, much of uh, Houston. And as I said, there's about three to four times uh, difference in the size in their, in their populations. All right, so just last, uh, last slide. Um, so we've been dealing with a, a relatively high fidelity SCIR style model that came from Lauren Myers and her, Matt, her uh, lab there. As I said, there's age and risk group uh, detail. That model captures weekdays, weekends, it knows school calendars. And so those contact matrices are changing throughout. There's kind of macro and micro uh, stochastics. There are some challenges in terms of fitting. Optimization is a challenge as well. Stochastic isn't easier, but it's really important. As I said before, don't try to fit a policy for, for a deterministic model and expect it to perform well. This half and quit square rule staffing really helps a lot in terms of, uh, we basically have done a grid search here for the optimization. Um, and I mentioned these analyses, we may try to combine all three. And one thing that's happened in Austin, I think the, the, the mayor uh, and other city leaders have uh, been messaging uh, the need for social distancing early on uh, and our modeling of human behavior or doing a better job of that is, uh, is important. Um, and again, thanks to everyone uh, who participated in uh, and, and really put in a, a heck of a lot of effort uh, to, to make this happen in relatively short order. And I do want to say that, uh, so Lauren Myers is the one that has uh, strong connections in, uh, uh, to city leadership in, in Austin. So I will stop there. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much for this talk um, that is really grounded in, uh, in real life. Uh, with the, even the Twitter uh, uh, <laughs> uh, 
um, what's going on uh, in people's minds. Uh, so we are open to questions now, and uh, you can either type your um, questions on the chat. Okay, um, Hector uh, has a question, but uh, maybe I should start with Bernardo Costa, um, who thanks, uh, thanks you for the talk. And uh, what happens if you invert the lockdown order to five or three instead of three, four, five? Especially if you know that you're reaching stage five with a high probability as time goes, wouldn't it be better to have a more stringent lockdown as soon as possible? <clears throat> so in principle, I agree with that. Uh, kind of the dynamic in, in Texas was that uh, the state wouldn't allow it. So you essentially had to be in, uh, so you can question the whole model. Why are you trying to uh, minimize days in lockdown while just barely staying within hospital capacity? You know, do, do you wanna minimize uh, morbidity or right, you could imagine all sorts of different performance measures. And so I think this model is appropriate in the context of uh, the if you must part of the of the talk, if you're effectively forced to relax social distancing, then uh, bringing it back in this kind of gradual way, I think made sense in the context of what cities uh, could uh, convince state government to allow them to do. But um, in principle, I agree with this, uh, this notion. Uh, so Hector, um, you were, I think, uh, unmuting yourself and asking the question. Yes, I've got it. Uh, so, sorry, I was I was typing my question, but anyway. <laughs> um, I know, nice talk. Thank you very much for your talk. I just want to know if you, in your model, either in your model or, or in Austin, Austin, have you tried another type of indicator, indicators to activate the, the, the lockdowns? I, I mean, activate cases, uh, uh, reproductive number, or this kind of, or traceability which is very important as well. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is a really important question, uh, right? So the way people are being tested, um, so the availability of tests and how uh, we're choosing uh, who gets tested uh, has varied a lot over time. And so there, there, I think there are some problems, at least in our context, with trying to use uh, the number of uh, positive test cases as a, as a trigger. And even if you look at deaths, it's obviously a, a trailing indicator, uh, but treatments have changed over time. And so one of the things that we found attractive was using hospital admissions uh, and smoothing it with the seven day average was, uh, had to do with the fact that, uh, that we thought that was relatively uh, stable in terms of an indicator over time. Sorry, and if I, if I understood correctly, the state itself used the same indicator, right? That's that's correct or not? The state? I mean, Texas, Austin, I don't... Uh, you, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Austin used that seven-day moving average. Yes. Okay. Only that? Yeah, that's the only indicator that's, that's used. Very interesting. Thank you very much. So, see. Uh, I guess I can see the questions in chat. Yeah, let me read it for, uh, because for the recording, I'm not sure if people see okay. it. So Alexander uh, has a question. The Twitter exchange in June suggests that people are trying to reason about the rate of change in hospitalizations. Would it make sense to have a policy that replaces the static triggers with anticipatory triggers go to stage four if the current number of hospitalizations plus the rate of change predicts is greater than 20 daily admissions in X days? Right, so the, I mean, the model is forecasting where, where things are going, right? So the model is seeing that exponential rise. And that's why, you know, we don't use, for example, uh, the number of people in the hospital as, uh, as a trigger, but rather the rate at which uh, they're, they're entering the hospital kind of exactly for that reason. Now that said, I mean, depending on where you are uh, in the, uh, the progression of the, the disease, then right, the, the, those rates vary. And that's why in that first model, we had that kind of step change, that we had a higher trigger uh, later on. Next question is from John Birch. 
Uh, he's asking, can you explain how you determine the parameters in your model? Yeah, so there's, <clears throat> there's a number of parameters where, uh, right, so the, the model is previously used for influenza. And so when you look at things like those contact matrices, uh, those are derived from daily logs, for instance. Uh, there are other parameters that are uh, COVID specific where like, we, we don't always know what those parameters are. And we, we use that triangular uh, distribution, for instance, for, for actually three of those parameters. And then I didn't talk about this, but um, there's, there's kind of a downsampling or uh, a rather crude version of particle filtering uh, to say those macro stochastics are sampled in a particular way, but we reject samples that are inconsistent with hospital, uh, hospital, hospitalizations up to uh, the, the current time period. And then the, so that's a form of fitting. And then the, the other part of the fitting is uh, there are sort of four time periods that are important before March 24th, between March 24th and Labor Day, uh, I'm sorry, Memorial Day. Uh, so late May, Memorial Day until late June, and then that period after uh, roughly June 25th. And so we do like a least squares fitting of the deterministic model, as opposed to doing like a Markov chain Monte Carlo, for example, for the stochastic model to estimate those parameters. So next question is from Claudia Sagas Isabel, um, and uh, she thanks you for your talk and very interesting model. What is the scale of the optimization problem you're dealing with? Right, so, uh, so roughly, say, 4,000 time periods, a little more than in the, the course of, uh, of a year. Uh, and then there are you know, roughly uh, 90 states, if there are about nine or 10 uh, compartments multiplied by the 10 age and risk groups. So that all is about the epidemiological dynamics. In terms of the, the optimization parameters, basically we do a grid search where uh, we will take those thresholds you know, from zero up to the, um, the, the half and width uh, limit and then discretize it in say five. And then when we're doing, um, uh, say, five thresholds, then, I mean, you're looking at something that is smaller than on the order of, you know, 20 to the power four in terms of uh, um, kind of the, the grid searches in that, uh, that number of evaluations. It takes a couple minutes with, uh, with 40 cores to just run the simulation model for a fixed uh, policy. So the next talk is from Sarah, uh, next question, sorry, is from Sarah Ryan. Uh, is the square root staffing rule constraint a substitute for chance constraint, or does the model have both type of constraints? Yeah, really good question. It's, uh, so in principle, you would say, hey, why do you need that square root staffing rule once you have the, the chance constraint? And the reason that we include that square root staffing rule is because it really reduces the uh, the grid search. So it, it reduces the size of the space that we need to, to search in order to uh, uh, to find the, the threshold policy. So in principle, you shouldn't need it, uh, but it turns out not to be limiting uh, in terms of uh, eliminating good solutions, and it's useful in terms of uh, efficiency of the algorithm, as it were. Manuel asks, does the model capture other events that have potentially aided the spread, uh, for instance, protest? Thanks for the nice talk. So it doesn't explicitly model uh, things like uh, protests, right? It doesn't model network effects. It doesn't model uh, super spreaders, right? It's this mass action homogeneous mixing uh, type model. Um, the only way it captures those in, is to the extent that uh, people show up in the hospital, then the, the beta parameters are being estimated uh, 
based on, on that. So only indirectly, but not explicitly being modeled. So Dario uh, wanted to have the publication and we will send it, but Bernardo already sent it and Hao Xiang uh, also, uh, one of the collaborators listed here also sent uh, some publications. Also, I've been asked if the recording will be available. Yes, it will be available. We have our um, new YouTube channel that we post uh, videos and we can also send that as well. So going back to the questions, uh, Wolfram Leesman, um says, great talk and work, thank you. Uh, how would you scale your model to a nationwide one? Is it sufficient to run separate local models or is there added value in a single joint model that can enforce regional lockdowns? So, so practically speaking, given the way things are in the US right now, uh, this is effectively a local issue. The, um, but the starting point for that model and the, and the model, so the, the CDC has a, a 500 cities uh, model and uh, or has a 500 cities study. And where the influenza version of this model uh, began, was it basically has um, this SER style model within each city, and then it has transportation uh, between cities. So yeah, it, it certainly makes sense to, to think about uh, a national model in general. Um, in terms of decision support right now, I think it's more at the, at the local level. Uh, may I may I say something? Uh, uh, yeah, well, it's just to comment that uh, uh, for us in the state of Sao Paulo, we are doing something related, let's say, not exactly the same. And it appeared to be very important to consider the whole state so that you take into account the commuting of people between different cities when they go for work. It was important for the dynamics of the disease, even if the decision is taken locally. Uh, taking into account how the virus travels because of this commute in this contact ma matrices uh, that are spatial uh, in space, that was important also for the local decisions. Yeah, makes, makes sense. Anton is asking or uh, saying great talk as always. A follow up to John's question. There is various types of censoring data. For example, only some people infected are um, detected. How did you take censoring into account when estimating model parameters? Right, so, so the, the model parameters that had to do with uh, that type of censoring uh, are things that we effectively took from the, the literature in terms of uh, people that are infected and, and being detected. Um, one place that we did face censoring uh, and, and had to deal with that is in the, when you look at duration in the hospital. Um, so right, there's some, there are long tails there. There's some people that are, that are still in the hospital. Uh, Paul that I'm pointing to here is, uh, um, he's at the, uh, the medical school at, at UT Austin uh, and, and he was using censoring techniques uh, uh, to, to estimate uh, hospital duration, ICU duration. It is an important uh, issue. And um, Johari asks, um, how did you come to 10 intervals each day? What is the impact on the model performance? Yeah, so basically we, we looked at this in, uh, in simpler settings with, uh, with uh, the rates and tried to understand the discretization error if, uh, if we had, uh, you know, five or 10 or, or 20, uh, <clears throat> and 10 seemed to be pretty good in terms of diminishing errors on discretization error. Uh, and then importantly, like once we fix the, uh, that sort of step size, then the, the model fitting that I've described and, uh, and like the down sampling, the sort of crude part, particle filtering, I mean, that's all in the, in the context of uh, that given step size. 
Thank you. Um, are there any other questions, comments? I don't see any more in the chat box, but you can also unmute yourself and ask. Uh, We've come to uh, a point where... Uh, maybe oh, can oh. I ask a question, David, it's Bernardo. Um, so one of the difficulties we have here in, in Rio is modeling some, some types of uh, professionals who are not stopping uh, work, like delivery people, like medical professions, and so on. Uh, did you try to get something like that into your model? And this is something that's easy to extend. Yeah, so we <clears throat> we didn't do that in this in the context of this specific model. Uh, <clears throat> so while I while I wasn't part of it, I mean, this is an issue, of course, in the in the U.S. as well. Um, <clears throat> like I know in Austin, uh, construction workers in particular, uh, there were uh, issues with respect to early spread uh, among construction workers. Certainly among the, the homeless population, uh, this is an issue. Um, you know, modeling long-term care facilities and, uh, and nursing homes, right? that's not something that's directly modeled in this, uh, in this mass action uh, model, but, but you really need more of, uh, of kind of network style models to, uh, to deal with those. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, one, one other question like similar in spirit would be, did you try to separate the population into one that's more risk averse and the other one which is more risk taker or take whatever partition to people who are going to expose themselves more or less? I think you, you showed a low risk and a high risk guideline. So this might be actually a, a good thing to try. Yeah, so it's something that's, <clears throat> it's something that's doable if we could get like reasonable data to uh, to inform that because, you know, you look at, um, that construct is built in there in a certain sense. Like when you look at kids, they, they kind of give more than they get, uh, in terms of, uh, spreading uh, the disease. And so that shows up in those contact matrices and it would be possible to further partition, uh, the population if, uh, if you could have, uh, estimates for sort of essential workers, for example, uh, and, and their contributions to, to potential spread. Okay, no, thank you very much. It was very, very nice. It's, it's good to see these, these models um, putting down some, some work and some, some policies for, for us. Thanks. Any other questions? Go to the next slide if you want, Kazin. Oh, oh, sure. Yes, let's do that. <laughs> I think it's about time, right? Okay. So, uh, thanks first of all, everybody, for Dave uh, for this wonderful talk, and uh, everybody from all around the world for attending the webinar. And so, I would like to end by announcing our next webinar, um, which is two weeks from now, same time, uh, and we will have Katya Scheinberg. We're very happy to have her. Um, give a talk. So I hope to see you once again uh, in that talk. So thank you so much. I'm going to um, stop the recording now.